Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 23. It's me, plus a trifecta of other people. We have today, Orion. Hey, what's up? We have Matt. Hey. And all the way from a different state, Wes. Hey, greetings from Pittsburgh. And today we're going to talk about, we're going to do a rich metatextual analysis. No, we're going to talk about the differences oh, between <laughs> board games and video games as media and how that changes how the games are designed and how we experience them and the culture surrounding them. So all of us, almost all of us, excluding perhaps one person, read a book in college that we enjoyed, again, excluding perhaps one person here among the four of us, called Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. I think it's one of the most important books I've ever read, at least. And the the basic thesis of the book is that you have George Orwell's 1984, which posited a horrible future where the government ruled by totalitarian force and imposed strict rules on everything and everyone and their thoughts and everything. And you also had Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, which was also a horrible future sci-fi thing, but everyone wasn't restricted by the government. They were essentially self-medicated into complacency they had all kinds of drugs to make them feel great in entertainment and they did nothing positive in the world and postman's thesis is that huxley had a better prophecy of what the future would look like and he's specifically talking about the impact of television on culture although a lot of it really applies to computers the internet generally yeah where he's saying because television is a visual medium and a medium designed for entertainment, it basically morphs everything within it towards this lens of, of entertainment. So even things like the news are now entertainment. And the incentives that the news have is to be entertaining rather than be, for instance, factual or informative. That's probably one of the most important observations he has. Is that is that a pretty good brief analysis of Postman? Yeah, you think? we would be re- remiss if we didn't with the little adage he has like uh orwell's vision was that what we hate would control us and huxley's vision was that what we love would come to control us right and so yeah. what the the class at least were i know wes that wes was able to take and learn about this was called was called media ecology and the idea is that you study media and mediums and analyze how they in themselves change the way we interact with the world and interact with them and, and interact about, with and think about things. The things that are conveyed through that medium. Uh, Marshall McLuhan is another probably more famous uh, person who did research in this. And his favorite, his famous phrase was the medium is the message, which kind of encapsulates the entire idea. But I don't necessarily want to talk about television or anything. I want to talk about what we can learn from the, the mediums of board games and video games and how, you know, both of them have kind of the same goals, which is to provide an interesting, entertaining gaming experience. But the kind of technological restrictions on the two concepts give us different design ideas and different ways to play games. Yeah, and I, I don't want to be a terminology uh, Nazi throughout this whole podcast. So I'm just going to say this on the outset. And if there don't are errors Nazi along the way, then that's totally fine, because I'll probably misspeak myself at some point. But So when we talk about media, what we're saying is the plural of medium. Um, Almost think about the the nutrient-rich layer of a Petri dish, that that is the medium through which the fungus or the bacterial culture grows. I know it's a somewhat negative analogy, but still, that's that's the medium. And when we talk about the media, we're talking about plurality of medium. And I'm probably using the distinction between mediums and media wrong. Well, there, there is no word. The mediums is not a word. Really? It doesn't exist. Thought yes. It was. That is, I mean, maybe it exists colloquially, but yeah. Dr. Gordon was very harsh on that particular okay. error. <laughs> I'll use media from now on as the plural. I know. Should we, here on the onset, start by like talking about what the medium of board games is? Sure, go for it. Yeah, well, what is the medium of, of board games? So it's physical things that can sit on your table. Mostly, yeah. Um, mostly, yeah. These are generalizations. Generalizations, sure. Well, Pieces would it be... you can pick up, cards you can read in place. 
So a physicality. Yeah, a physicality. Would would then the term analog games be more precise? You think? I mean, board games. Yeah. You know, if you're going strictly, you know, half of the games we play aren't board games because they don't have a board. Yeah. But you know, people kind of know what you mean when you say it. Uh, I know some people use analog games I or like tabletop that. games. But then again, like, is charades a board game? It's with people directly, and it doesn't involve technology, but it also has no board and no table. Well, it definitely is its own medium, because so if we try to strip video games down to their most basic layer of Pong, which is just a simplistic iteration of tennis, the two players that are sitting there are interacting with each other via the technology through the television but i mean if you're sitting there playing viticulture or you know uh carcassonne or whatever you are interacting with the other players via this external third party medium which is the tiles or the game board or the resources yeah might we say that a board game is a game you play with other well even then you have solo games i don't know i I suppose the main distinction is the technology involved is that board games are primarily with non-digital technology although obviously there's a blend there's been a merger of that in some games lately yeah to me that's the most important distinction anyway yeah because obviously you can still sit in a room across from another person in or next to another person and play a video game although there's less and less of that yeah there is less and less of that that's an interesting thing you know four college kids playing split screen halo is a cool thing that maybe doesn't happen as much today because games don't include split screen Mm -hmm. Um, but i think in contrast with board games where you sit around the table i can see you video games you might interact with the other people, but it's always through the screen. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest thing that I thought of while I was thinking about the distinction between the two, there were a couple of other authors that we read through in the media ecology class, and one of them was Josh Morkin, and he co-wrote a book called Distracted, The Erosion of Attention and the Coming Dark Age, which of course is an incredibly apocalyptic and I wonder what he that's thinks. really that's really dramatic. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a very dramatic title, but he goes into the different styles or types of attention, and he labels them as orienting attention, alerting attention, and executive attention. And I just have a, an outline in front of me, so I don't recall whether he was basing that off of actual psychological research or if he was kind of coining these phrases. From what I remember, I think he he was actually you know sourced and <laughs> did some did some research on this topic. But basically, orienting attention is something that every living creature has that it orients itself to its environment. Alerting attention is like the fight or flight. A stick cracks in the woods and you turn your head to look at where the stick cracked. And executive attention is higher order thought that you actually have to suppress your alerting attention in order to exercise executive attention, like through reading or doing math or whatever, what have you. And... One point that he makes in his book, Distracted, is that TV and smartphones and like all, all these electronic devices, they just prey on alerting attention because alerting attention gives you that hit of all those wonderful neurochemicals of like, oh, something's happening. I need to know. And that was the one thing that, that, that I saw as the big distinction between video games and board games is that one video games really goes after alerting attention. Like, it puts you in hazardous situations where you need to react. Whereas board games, most board games really go after executive attention, where you have to sit and think and really go after it with your full brain power. Yeah, so that's one of the things that you can do in video games because you can essentially hide parts of the game behind the code. So you can surprise people with parts of the game that they didn't know were going to happen. Whereas in a board game, if you're surprised with something, it's something that that like you revealed with your hands, like like flipping over a card, or it's something someone else did deliberately. There's no, there's no like jack in the box in the board game that springs out and surprises you. It's something more deliberate if there is to be surprise. How would like Space Alert classify into that? Is that a board yeah, game that immediately that... comes to mind as a. Is that a board game that that flourishes on the uh, I can't remember the names, but the the second type of attention more you'd say, 
or we a learning attention. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought of Space Alert immediately as well. That it is the game that preys on alerting attention. It really is. If, if Space Alert was a video game, like it could it could build and prey on that alerting attention so much more and it would be hard to design a video game that didn't because it's so easy to do that whereas because it's a board game it's super fascinating and awesome that they use the track but i think the medium allows the the designers of the game to not make it just about reacting to things well if it was a board game there would be a lot more visuals involved or excuse me if it was a video game there would be a lot more visuals involved Right. right And the the other thing that we have to remember is that something that's a novelty in human experience is a subversion of a norm. So Space Alert, I think, has that little extra thing going for it because it's a subversion of board games. It, it, it doesn't fit into an archetype. It's not a Catan clone. It's not a Love Letter clone. It is its own unique thing because it's subverting the form itself. It's subverting what the medium itself tends towards. And I think it's an example of, we're not saying that type of attention is necessarily bad. Space Alert uses it to create a sense of urgency and a, and a sense of tension. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's still one of our interesting, favorite games because yeah, it's, of that. It's still a great, interesting game. We're not trying to all over video games here no we all in love fact, video games in fact i think this is a lovely managing conversation but can we talk about what video games are what are video games what what do they do well what can they do because they are what they are they can do narrative better they can do visuals better they can do you said earlier, surprise they can, better they can hide things from they these, can hide things they, they can do more complex things more complex background mathematics that you can't do in board games. In board games, you have to keep the mathematics really simple. Those would be the main things off the Randomness top of my head. Randomness would be something that is... No, they... I mean, video games can do more complex randomness, but like... Yes, okay, more complex randomness. Most board games have a sure. good enough random number generator built in. in sure, but dice. I think I think randomness on a entirely larger scale... Oh, sure. In terms of, like, the number of possible random outputs? Yeah. In board games, it's usually, like, the size of the deck of cards that you're given. In video games, it can uh, be millions. Of, or, like, you know, even, like, procedural stuff. Board games can't really do procedural things. At the risk of sounding maybe a little pretentious, I'm going to give an analogy that I think that board games are something that your mind and your personality sort of orbits around, where it's, like, on the table in front of you and you have all these other people... And your thoughts sort of rotate around it and try to take in it all in at different angles. And in some ways, you can get immersed in that. But I think that a video game really sucks you in. It's something to escape the real world and enter into a different world and experience that separate world as its own unique, coherent experience. I think that entirely depends on the genre of game. Yeah, I was going to say, I think as a, a generality, I think you're probably right, Wes. But my thought immediately goes to the, the that genre of strategy games, in particular that Grand you play. strategy games that I like, yeah. Yeah, so what do, the, what do those games Th- show Those are about like a board game with a million pieces that you can't logistically move around on a table because the one I like the best is about the history of the entire world for a period of four centuries. There are hundreds of nations, and they all have armies and economies and diplomacy and all of these systems going on that there's just too many things to represent in an analog tabletop medium, for lack of a better word. But it's it's really, if you look at the form of it, it's more of a board game than something like Halo. Absolutely. It's just right. you happen to and... interact with it through a bunch of pixels on a screen rather than a bunch of, you know, squares on a table. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when they designed that game, first of all, name the game, but when they Europa. Des- <laughs> Europa, Europa Universalis. Okay. Yeah. And when they when they designed it, part of their reason for designing it was realizing that some video games don't have ticking systems behind the the Yeah, so one of the driving reasons there is in some interview I read, the designer was saying he'd played other games and found out eventually that it was all just random underneath and there wasn't a reason for why certain things were happening. It wasn't that this action led to this action that led to this action. 
or the, you know there was there's no system or reason to what was happening it was just arbitrary and the patterns he was trying to notice were actually just noise so one of the reasons or one of the principles that they kind of applied in building Europa is that they wanted complex systems that actually deterministically said this is actually how much money you're making from this trade node and you can drill all the way down and see exactly how much comes from every province in the nearby region and how much your merchant does and how much your nation power does or whatever and it's all like it's all mathematically calculated and you could go look at it if you wanted to and see all the way down and like you said are there any turtles at the bottom it is not turtles all the way down (laughs) (laughs) sorry and like you said there's no way that you could put one percent of that game on a table even though the systems are right i mean such that in theory yeah you could you could build little right what's the widgets the war to of represent north everything africa, then, Mark, yeah, the campaign for north africa campaign for north africa yeah. it's like that's the level of detail that they can yeah. put into a video game because they've got a you know three gigahertz processor and a terabyte of memory you know but to store in, all of this in the same way that you can do philosophy with smoke signals you can play out the entire history of the world on a million tables. Given that nobody gets bored. But there but but <laughs> But it's impractical. But it's impractical yeah. and it's not, it's not right an experience that anyone would, would actually the have. Experience. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. The computer is a a good tool for the Europa experience precisely because it can hold so much detail and in memory. Yeah. Information. The the information density of a computer is way higher than a board game table or smoke signals to now, go back it, to the postman. And so I don't I don't think the the jump scare or the alert attention is inherently well, it's maybe more more common in video games, but I don't think it's well, an I think it is in, in I, part of video games. But it, it's in it's an inherent thing about the medium. The I think, the computer is uniquely capable of generating random events that suddenly show up in front of your face sure i mean in in the way that any outside agent can and the way that a board game there's no agent in the board game yeah right and the computer can act as an agent because there was a developer that spent lots and lots of time simulating the computer acting like an agent and you can't see or necessarily predict everything it's going to do to me the the popular I would say probably what 80% of people have invested in in video games is something that is a catered world that they can escape to. I guess just from the, again, again looking at the computer as a much better processor of information that those worlds are more easily made. Although when you compare it to something on tabletop like RPGs, you have, I, there's no way to not sound cheesy on this, the power of imagination doing... Kind of the same thing. <laughs> but Orion's right. There are no jump scares in a board game because there's no there's no agency there. Although that seems to be changing. I, I know that Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is a is a slightly older game. I think it came out in the early two thousands, late nineties uh, or something. Seventies. The seventies. Oh yeah. geez. Yeah. Okay. Um, Practically ancient. But I the two games that I played most recently, I, I played Time Stories two weeks ago and then i played sherlock holmes consulting detective on saturday and both of those games try to have agency of their own well they're kind of like a choose your own adventure style right sort of but with time stories especially you make choices and you have no clue where those choices are going like it they they have like they have these like pre-sealed packets in plastic that say don't open this packet until instructed you know it, it's it's this weird driven experience yeah and well, and the same thing with legacy games now is that i was thinking about this when i was writing up my notes is that a lot of the things i was generalizing legacy games were an exception to because they're in a very small way trying to create that hidden code aspect it's just like you know, a box with something in it instead of a bunch of code that can surprise you. But they're trying to give that element of the game where traditionally you would say a board game is something you can open up and examine every piece of it before you even play the game and understand every bit of it. But legacy games and looks like time stories 
don't do that. They, they, they purposely try to withhold information from you. I think it's more of a general concept, though. It's this idea of creating a narrative where you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so you're experiencing it like you would, you know, some period of time and that you you have an action and there's cause and effect and you have an action and something happens. And then based on that, you make another decision and, you know, go down a different path. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. I just I think it's it's a more general concept and it's not unique to legacy games. It's unique in that you're supposed to not know the possibilities. So, for instance, you know, many games have random effects, but theoretically you could look through all of the cards that reveal those effects before you played the game and understand what possibly could happen. That's the distinction. Yeah, and in Legacy games, well, I'll say Pandemic Legacy Season 1, it's not trying to give the same kind of board game experience that nearly every other board game is is giving it's giving this kind of narrative story based experience where it doesn't matter that you don't know th- the things that are going to come because it's about the experience i mean that was one of your problems with pandemic legacy is like things would happen in the middle of a of a of a, a round and it's like well we couldn't have planned for that well, I mean, I think it's something, I think this legacy thing is hard to do well in board games precisely because board games are so bad yeah. as a medium at doing it. Yeah. Like, one, you know, I, I enjoyed Pandemic Legacy quite a bit, but the big problem I had with it is that it would maybe kind of hint at something that would happen in the future. And then you'd be like, well, does it want me to change my strategy or does it want me to keep doing what's been effective so far? And then it was just a toss up of whether or not that guess was correct it was trying to do this narrative thing when it's a very hard thing to do a game like halo where you're playing through a first person you're playing through a campaign it's able to be far more adaptable so as your experience changes as big things happen that you couldn't have foreseen the gameplay experience can adapt because computer because they could program that in the ground it gives you to explore is much broader. So, like, in Pandemic Legacy, if you wanted to go noodle around for five turns, you would just lose the game and be punished. If you did that in Halo, you could just resume back where you were. Or you can try something out, but save your game beforehand and come back. My point, I guess my point's a little different. The point my, that I'm trying to make is, if you throw a like something that fundamentally alters the game, if you throw that at the player in a video game, the gameplay experience can adapt. The gameplay experience changes how, however it should. And it just, it works well in a video game because they can do whatever they need to do. We, we were still playing Pandemic before and after the game completely changed. Do you get what I'm saying? Kind of. I think what you're saying is that, the again, the, the video game has more resources to redefine things. So it can, for instance, like map actions to different buttons or change you know, what resources are available to you. Whereas mm-hmm. in Pandemic Legacy, it's restricted to what they can fit in this box. Yeah, I think... And so they have a, much fewer resources to do those kinds of dramatic things with the, the fundamental gameplay. I, I think you're you're saying it well, what I'm trying to say and saying poorly. Yeah. Or, or, even, or even like the Half-Life 2 campaign. All the games that I've ever played are going to come out very shortly. Yeah, they're all like 10 <laughs> years old. Yeah, same, same with me I mostly. A better example of this in video games would be something like uh, Mass Effect or The Witcher, where there are choices that you make during the game which change the future of your experience. And you don't know what those futures are. You come to a point and you make a decision and then maybe you die. Or maybe this important character dies. Or maybe... It's Star Wars and you go to the dark side or something. Yeah, and then you compare it to where board games have tried to do that with like Above and Below and Near and Far and the, the number of outputs is and possibilities is just necessarily so restricted. Although yes, right. there was a game I haven't played called Seventh Continent that's trying to do that kind of big narrative and it's like 1,200 cards or something. It's, you know, just, it's just a giant box full of cards. And I I think it'd be interesting, but it, but I think it's necessarily a challenge for board games to do that kind of narrative thing. Board games are much better at other things. And I'm excited that board games are trying to do more narrative ideas and and I'm saying narrative in kind of a really strict sense, like board games do narrative really well, but usually in the context of like, 
social narrative, like psychological narrative between players. You know, you right, have. Right. I was listening to a YouTube video earlier today with uh, Gary Kasparov, and he was talking about his like four most memorable games of chess. And he's t- he's talking about them like a story, like a psychological battle. But it's just chess, you know. Those are the kind of narratives that board games are generally better at. Right, right. Rather than like a story like you would read in a book or see in a movie. Here are the things that I brainstormed. I came out from the perspective of what are fundamental differences in the two media and what are the results of those differences. So the first one I came up with is that in a board game, you're sit- generally sitting around a table with other people or at least close by other people, whereas video games, you're generally sitting alone in front of a screen. Obviously, you know, there's split screen and all that, but that's less common now. And, and the result of that, I think you see very clearly, and this is immediately the first thing that came to mind when I thought of this topic, is that when you are physically close to other people, there is a much higher social uh, barrier and disincentive to horrible abusive behavior. So you have far fewer stories of like people going off about your mom while playing viticulture than you do people playing Call of Duty. And that's just part of how video games function because they create that kind of inherent anonymity when you're playing multiplayer games that there's less of a social barrier to being a horrible person. Yeah, well, that that's the Jonathan Gabriel theory of the internet, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that normal person plus anonymity means just total aberrant social outcast and person willing to say or do anything to cause a ruckus. Yeah, and unless you're playing, like, play-by-mail board games or playing, you know, on a forum or something, you don't have that. In other words, like... The way I was thinking about it was people who act really nice in a video game are the unusual ones. People who act really mean and horrible during a board game are the unusual people. Yeah, you're abstracting away the the other people in, in a, a video game. Like, if you are playing with other people, there's an avatar that represents them in some way. Right. A video game is more maybe immersive because of the visual stimulation of a screen as opposed to sometimes very abstract pieces on a board and physically being close to another person and just being more aware of the social implications as opposed to the experiential immersiveness. With a board game, there's almost like the other metagame of like making sure everyone else at the table is still having fun right. or you know just the social experience in general that you don't typically have. Yeah. I mean, you, you still could have it in a board game if you're like a, you know, an MMO raid leader and you're trying to make sure everyone's on board with your strategy or whatever. But there's more of that in board gaming. I was just thinking about Sheriff of Nottingham and how part of the fun of that game for me is like when we have our little exchanges with the sheriff and we say, oh, I'm just bringing all of my loaves of bread to the market. And we have this very human interaction of bribery and lying and sometimes telling the truth. And part of the hilarity of that game to me is imagining Goose in a Renaissance fair costume (laughs) carrying like five three foot long loaves of French bread in his arms. (laughs) <laughs> like seriously guys it's just bread i and, promise and yeah. a giant crossbow <laughs> hidden in the middle of them <laughs> right right yeah i hate that game <laughs> <laughs> oh man the next point i had was I, I titled intentionality versus convenience and that's just the reality of like how hard it is relatively to play a board game with other people versus how easy it is to pick up and play most video games. And that if you want to, you know, unless you're playing solo, unless you, if you want to play a board game, you have to find other people who are willing to meet up with you physically at the same time and commit a certain amount of time sitting all next to each other playing the game. Whereas unless, again, you're like trying to get a specific group together for a particular video game, you can just hop on a video game and play the single player or or hop on even and play the multiplayer against random people. There's not that like prior commitment involved in playing a video game where there is in board games. And the results or the impact of that that I thought of was maybe you you know with a board game, at least I know I'm more appreciative of the time spent when I play a board game whereas a video game is kind of just 
even games that I love and I really appreciate and I think they're really good cinematic experience or intellectual experience or whatever, I feel like there's something more about a board game that's special because it's with other people who want to be there with you specifically playing that specific game. I think to some degree you're romanticizing that experience because I'm not saying it's completely wrong. I'm just saying that, well, okay, it's unfair to compare playing a game with your friends around the table that you've planned ahead of time to playing with rando strangers in League of Legends. Those but are that's just, the nature. Just different things. That's the nature that's of what I'm the saying. mediums. That's what I'm but saying. I they are just, different. But things. I can go play a game with my friends online and have an, an amazing experience similar to sitting around a table playing a board game. With yeah, people. that's fair. And I mean, I mean, you can have that experience with your friends anywhere in the world with League of Legends. So there's some, there's definitely something to be said for that. What I'm saying is that there's a greater cost to playing a board game generally than there is a video game. I in don't in think time it's, and it's, convenience. It's not, a to- it's not a cost in time. It's a cost in logistically being in the same place. Yeah, yeah. It's a logistical cost, yeah. Which, is well, which can create time cost. But it's that's like a secondary effect of the, the time to travel to a, a, lo- a shared location. I just, I think that's not the point. I'm not sure the distinction you're trying to make. I'm saying video games, when I'm playing, you know, party queue with people give me a similar experience to getting together and playing a board game. And that is more convenient because of the nature of the internet. Mm -hmm. But I don't think one is inherently more valuable than the other. No, I mean, I think I'm saying for me, I feel, I feel like it's more not valuable. I feel like it's, but you just said more appreciative of the time. It's just, you value that time more, right? I'm more, I feel like I'm more cognizant of the fact that it was logistically challenging to do this and that makes it a little bit more special for me. I mean, it's almost the same thing as like Skype is wonderful in that I can have face-to-face conversations with my family, but I still go home for Christmas so we can sit around a table together. Yeah, kind of. There's a bit of that, I suppose. If I could suggest a segue. Yeah, yeah. It's fairly obvious that... Myself, Goose, and Mark are all fairly bought into Postman and Media Ecology, but it was brought up that Orion really does not agree with Postman, or doesn't like Postman. I just wanted to give him the opportunity to voice his disagreement. I don't know if I have the right language to express myself properly. I think it's that you're, like, way overdoing something that's almost self-evident, of, like, different things are different and that just seems obvious to me that the internet is different than a physical table or having speed of light communication to send images to your television is different than writing a letter and sending it on a a boat across the ocean. That those are different experiences just seems self-evident to me, but I don't like that we seem to immediately infer value judgments that because something's fast, it's bad. I mean, I'm not trying to make value judgments necessarily. I think I'm trying to point out the ways in which video games as a medium do things differently and therefore create different experiences than board games. So for in in this particular example, I think I find board games a a little bit like they bring me a little bit more pleasure because of the intentionality of, of getting together for it. But as I was saying before, I think board games have a much harder time doing the kind of narrative things that they're trying to do in legacy games that video games can just do. Like they're just part of video games. The the reason I find this interesting is that I think it's not just pointing out that different things are different. It's pointing out that there are inherent differences in things and those have implications for how we interact with them. And how they change us. Yeah, which is honestly the the hard part i guess to to analyze whereas you know postman talks a lot about how television can change like attention spans or it can change how much entertainment we demand or what we expect of of things on the television and those are like you know those are things you can look at over decades of sociological research the difference between board games and video games is largely speculative on my part but i find it interesting to say okay what can board games do well that video games can't do and what can video games do well that board games can't do 
And I think that's fine. I'm not as interested in that sort of maybe form discussion, if that's the right terminology. Maybe it's not. But if you go look at all your examples, like one is you have this positive expression of people sitting around a table and the other is people are terrible to each other online because of the anonymity. And another well, one is... Well, those things are demonstrably true. Oh, sure. We know those things are true. What are you trying to get at by pointing them out? I would say I, that's the only one, at least in the things I noted, where I think video games are clearly worse. With the whole observation for observation's sake and saying that different things are different because they're different, it's the four of us trying to critique something because we love it. That it's us trying to make observations that we can then expound upon in a way that is going to be interesting and maybe even entertaining for people. In but it's not... <laughs> Go ahead. He said the ultimate irony. <laughs> Right. Well, that's what we're doing. We're streaming. We're yeah, streaming. Sure. We're making a podcast. Hopefully people will enjoy this and maybe their minds will be slightly expanded. That's partially fair, but I'm interested in understanding kind of the the inherent biases of the things that I do. If I had the willpower, I might change the things I do a lot more, but it's at least a step to understanding what I can expect the things I do to do. I think maybe it might have been an error to frame this discussion in terms of Postman because he's he's focusing on media that are like completely ubiquitous in culture. And while video games are getting there, board games certainly are still very niche in culture. So we can't talk the same way about board games that post we, that we that Postman talks about like clocks. No, we couldn't even talk about these things in the same way that Postman talks about television because there are very limited ways that we can interact through these mediums. You Media. Know, me <laughs> I've been saying mediums ever since you first said it incorrectly. Have I, have I corrupted recording. you? Yeah. We can't learn what's happening in the real world through either board games or video games. We can't form complex opinions about current politics based on it. Now, they might influence our, our minds or how we think or how we build up structures in our minds that would then influence how we, we think about the real world, real world politics or whatever. Maybe you feel that way if the last video game you played was Half-Life 2. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. That was that was me throwing a little shade there. But I mean, you have things like Spec Ops The Line, which criticizes the military industrial complex, particularly the United States. You or, have actually, that one specifically like, criticizes video games. Yes, and you also have weird kind of out of place moments like in The Witcher 3 as a side quest you talk to a hunter who is an outcast in his community and if you like really probe him and go really far down his dialogue tree you find out that he's an outcast because he was a homosexual and one of the prompts that you can do in that dialogue tree is it you know it's okay I know how it feels I've been labeled as a freak too so that is definitely trying to push a cultural message that is relevant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that has become more and more a part of video games in the last, say, 10 years. Yeah. In that we yeah, use yeah. the medium of video games to make a point about culture or society in a way that didn't used to be the case. Part of that's also due to the increasing amount of money in video games and the decreasing costs to build one. So you see the same thing in movies where you have cheaper video cameras when video technology comes out and you have the sudden boom of independent films that are often more radical or more political, things like that. Same so I think you like, see that at, with like Steam Greenlight and like indie, lot, lots more indie game initiatives and stuff. Same thing with like the electric piano and the electric organ and rock music. There was a certain outrage that this is bringing the power of music creation to the masses. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And then, you know, what, what's going to be the result of that? Well, the Beatles, for one. And <laughs> we all know what a scourge upon the earth that was. Am I the only person here who likes the Beatles? Probably. I'm saying a thing. You don't cheek. like the I Beatles mean, either, Wes? I don't really care. No, I Beatles. don't. I don't care for them. Uh, I like their really weird stuff. Anyway. I like their more I wish I wish stuff. women screamed at me the way they screamed at the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, I, I think I'm probably been a bit unfair in how i've come into this discussion because i'm so used to video games being framed in this negative light that i am probably overly defensive 
against that and because i hear a lot of just baseless accusations of oh video games make you stupid or oh video games make you violent which that's an entirely different discussion and right, a yeah. whole mess of a lot of stupid but, yeah people and another and another reason to understand it is so that we can criticize it correctly sure and yeah. you have people who don't understand things throwing blind accusations like video games are causing people to worship satan and kill people and it like that's just it's not true right. and you that started with board games though <laughs> yeah, that's specifically true. dungeons and dragons that's true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hot thing of the 80s no that was interesting no I, I think i have a more clear idea of what we're talking about also i think that was good to kind of clear the discussion of the podcast more podcasts need a why on earth are we even talking about this segment in the middle <laughs> as opposed to at the beginning or end why not yeah, so i always try to have these conversations at the beginning and you're like well, Matt, so what the heck are you the, talking about the, the, the podcast the podcast format it dives right in it catches the the, the listener immediately yeah and i mean that's defining terms does not really catch the ear i think about this very deliberately is that the reason i don't want a super crazy like high polished podcast is because the benefit of podcast is the conversation of it like right. the medium is very good at conversation and conversation is good for certain things it's good for wrestling out ideas like this you know socrates would argue it's the best way of doing philosophy and other people would although i'm not entirely sold on that but I'm sticking primarily in terms of total output on the Thoughtful Gamer to writing because I think the precision of writing is so important and so lost. And I don't want to become one of those people who only does spoken word things because it's simply less precise. So, so hold on. <laughs> because you brought up Socrates, I'm going to bring up Socrates. Oh, no. So Socrates is sometimes hailed as the first media ecologist. Because oh, in Phaedrus, Phaedrus between pages, I guess in whatever edition this is, 274 and 277, maybe it's verses or something. He argues that writing is terrible and that oh, yeah. shouldn't write. Yeah, he's all about the yeah. dialogue. But then he right. went on and, and wrote all of Socrates' dialogues and his own dialogues and started like, isn't he like the father of philosophy and writing in that whole... Well, no, Socrates didn't write down anything. I know, Plato wrote everything. Yeah, yeah. But, but he did write them as dialogues. Right. But um, it's just funny that he makes his two principal arguments are that, that writing aids recollection but injures memory. So, like, you can look something oh, up I remember and remember this. And turn yeah, to the yeah. Page. Yeah. But it doesn't actually create the truth of memory, which is, you know, the ideal in your head. And that writing does not speak back to the auditor, to the reader. Like writing, like you cannot pose a question to a book and then the book will answer you. The book has to assume all of your questions, which it will usually do inaccurately. And there's an example, I think, of someone making a fairly accurate examination of the media, but just having completely, in my mind, wrong value judgments about them. <laughs> <laughs> Socrates would hate the Google effect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Socrates would take the hemlock willingly. <laughs> he lived today. Oh man, it was living today would be like his version of living in the movie *Idiocracy*. There's a great bit in *Amusing Ourselves to Death* where Postman talks about oral societies versus script societies and what is considered intelligence, and he gives King Solomon as the example of intelligence in a oral society, where he could hold thousands of proverbs in mind. So the point is very succinct and yet widely applicable pieces of wisdom mm -hmm. in mind that could that he could pull out and apply to whatever situation was needed. In a script society, that's like quaint. It's like, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's not considered intelligence in a, in a script society. Interesting, yeah. Well, it's like an intellectual lack of division of labor. Like you have to have very broadly applicable knowledge to be intelligent rather than very specific knowledge in a world where you can look up the things you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move back to board games now that we've reconsidered all of our assumptions about this podcast and go over my last couple of 
comparative points. So the next one I have is open design versus hidden design. And we talked about this a bit where in video games, you can hide the code. You can hide the information in board games. You can't do that with very limited exceptions. And that combined with the computing power of video games allows them to do much, much more complicated things and more surprising things and do more with narrative and do more. Whereas in board games, they need to be more internally consistent and logical and hold up to scrutiny of seeing all of the parts laid bare. Being a developer, software developer, I like understanding how code works. So sometimes I like knowing how they actually make a system work in a video game, but I don't generally dig down into the code to be like oh here's this for loop. oh that actually generated. brings up something yeah. that i was thinking about is that this one and the last point i'll bring up the exception on the video game side is like super hardcore people so nice. like there are people who actually do look into the code of video games and find out how they compute in certain things and like essentially dissect the game and make this point slightly less strong but it, i think it's still something obviously the video games can do that board games have a very limited time in doing which makes me wonder like gloomhaven we have the gloomhaven box here like board games are limited again to the physicality of the box how much bigger a board game box is going to be getting as they try to be more ambitious it's going to be the same evolution as uh computers so it's like it'll get massive as you try to build a bigger cpu and then I don't even know how. Then we'll have quantum market. board games that can yeah. like inter in, was it interposition? Is that when you like superposition? Superposition, superposition fit, yes. Fit things into like between <laughs> atoms. <laughs> no, well, more it's just like things can be multiple things at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah. So you could you have... you'll look down and you'll see your avatar, but it'll be blurry and there'll be this nice probability curve <laughs> of different transparencies of all, your avatar. All in the all moves positions. you might make on that turn. Oh gosh. <laughs> Quantum board gaming is the future. It's a future. <laughs> it's well, certainly a future. <laughs> <laughs> the darkest future. It's the darkest this timeline. Is the darkest we, timeline. We are in the darkest timeline that the Patriots are playing the Eagles in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I think I'm drawn to board games precisely because I like trying to figure out the whole system. And I'm also not going to put in the obsessive amount of time required to do that in, in some of the video games in which you could possibly. I mean, even if, if I just think of like dominant species, you know, the first time I played that, by the end of the game, I had kind of in mind, okay, I'm starting to grasp my mind around kind of the outskirts of, of the system. And then after three or four plays, I have a really good working knowledge of the system. And then, you know, all subsequent plays are just kind of refining that working inside of that machine. Mm -hmm. That's how good board games all work. I think that's yeah. what board games are, are, are good at. With board games, because of their nature as usually just puzzles, like board games do puzzles really well, and we'll talk about that more a bit later, but also because you can kind of see everything and comprehend everything, you approach them as something to master and be better at. With video games, a lot of them, especially like really narrative ones, like now I'm seeing games that are being shipped. Amber just started Horizon Zero Dawn and on the difficulty slider, there was like normal and hard and hardest, but before normal, there's easy. And then the easiest one was just called story. And I didn't see the description, but I imagine it's like you just kind of can't die and you just experience the game. And you can't, yeah, you can't do games. that with a wow. board game. Wow. But because... Video games are good at, at doing that kind of narrative thing. They can they can give that option to people where they're not really challenged at all. They're just experiencing the process of playing it. On the other hand, you can play board games like that. But I think the way board games present themselves to you, it's something like, hey, here's a challenge where you're trying to do better than you did last time. Or you're trying to figure something out about the game well, okay. on, a, on a solution level almost. And this is also a result of the ease of narrative in video games one slight i don't know uh point on this in video games is that it's more complex and it's not immediately apparent like in board games maybe you read the rule book and then you understand how the game works oh that's true yeah yeah but in video games to generalize a little bit you could think of the rule book as all of the game files that explain how it works 
but you don't actually have to read that to play you just kind of experience it and it tells you these are the inputs you can do to the system like these are the moves you can make but it doesn't have to completely describe the effects of everything because it manages all the upkeep and the you know what does a jump do like when you jump on this block and you push this button or something maybe all you have to do on your keyboard is press space and then press e or something but and then the game calculates oh we need to change the graphics here and spawn this item or object and you know change the environment and give you points or you know whatever. sure yeah yeah this is giving me nightmares because i'm an i'm imagining a world where video games have no gui and they have no tutorials and what you have to do is read through the code <laughs> and, and figure out how the game works i mean that's kind of how board games it. are like you you unpack the game literally you unpack it <laughs> You look at all the pieces, and then there's a book you have to read to understand how the pieces work together. Right. Yeah, I didn't even this. I didn't even think of this. Well, and as a result, video games are really good at doing tutorials, and it's hard to do a good tutorial in a board game. I have seen exactly one good one in mm-hmm. Fog of Love, and I know board games are trying to do more tutorials, but by some accounts, they're largely failing. Well, in the cost, th- there's a cost to it too. Like right. Three percent of the paper in Fog of Love is tutorial. I mean, that's three percent of the cost of what's inside the box, and that's in a really and, easy game to learn too. Right, right. Can you imagine yeah. a like Venus or Here I Stand doing a tutorial? Yeah. It would have to be like half of the physical product. Well, they do have like a learn to play game, and they tell you like do this, and then because of that, this happens. Which yeah, is sort of a tutorial. It's kind as of close yeah. as they get, to but it. it's still like reading a novel about the game. <laughs> yeah, because narrative is so easy in in video games. They fold the tutorials into yeah narrative. Well, and the and thing is, a good tutorial in a video game is when you don't even notice it's happening. Like Portal, like the first third of the game is the tutorial, but it's so well done and it's not displayed as a tutorial that, and you have so much fun with it, it just feels like you're playing the game, but they're actually slowly introducing each part of the game. Whereas a bad quote unquote tutorial in video games is when they just kind of show you step by step what the game is. But in board games, that's a good, you know, Fog of Blood does that really well. Like step by step, here's what this does, here's what this does. And we think that's, in the board game world, that's almost revolutionary. One other thing is in some video games, like uh, World of Warcraft is the one I'm thinking of, there are people that run websites that will go data mine all the new files when an expansion comes out and get all the stats for like all the new weapons and classes and they'll like, how do you do this quest? And they'll document all of that and there's enormous guides of like, here's how this boss fight goes and here's all the mechanics that happen. So I think it kind of comes back to the point that video games can manage so much more detail and complexity Mm -hmm. and they can do that in such a way that you as the person or the player don't have to be aware of all of it because it can kind of do it yeah well yeah and it's like you know both have to manage space but in board game terms managing space is in like terms we can see and understand and it's hold the three spatial dimensions yeah. in like a computer. The idea of like a spatial limitation is this weird abstract thing we have to think about and don't necessarily understand like, Oh, the CPU can't do that. Like we just know it can't do that or it can, we don't understand what that means in terms of, or at least I don't, you understand what it means in terms of like computing power or, you know, however you classify that, that information. The last point I want to talk about, which kind of expands on the one we were just talking about, is I put abstract versus presented, but that's a terrible wording. The idea is that board games, again, because they're limited in how much information they can have inside the box, necessarily have to abstract out a lot of information, while video games can, still with using logic, but they can do that, again, a billion times better, and they can turn that into worlds and 3d models and narrative right, and fiction yeah. and all that and the so best, the best board games are using wooden cubes and plastic cubes are the best yeah not miniatures it's what just about, cubes <laughs> what about cubes are the height of board of gaming what about cones? tokens of affection 
Tokens of affection. Yeah. What about spheres? I would. Ex- I would. I would. Yeah, cones are good. Dominant species does cones, not tiny cylinders. Those are the worst shape. How about found the space through- alert? Cone, but not really a cone, and slightly misshapen. <laughs> slightly oh, the misshapen cylinder? cylinder? Oh, the cylinder, yeah. Yeah, the cylinder misshapen cylinder. That is the worst thing in all of board gaming. No, I like cubes. Anyway, because of that, board games tend to fundamentally just be a puzzle. And again, there there's lots of ways in which their sh- board games are shaping narrative. You know, Wes talked about time stories, which is trying to kind of bridge the gap between board games and, and an RPG and do different things with narrative but which it does incredibly poorly and you should never buy it and don't go get it right now please don't just don't do it don't support (laughs) that publisher but ultimately the vast majority of board games are puzzles they're puzzles usually with sometimes not but usually with randomizing elements within the game or with the fact randomizing in quotes uh playing against a different person who you can't entirely predict whereas video games can make your actions feel less discreet and more like the real world. And so like movement is like the real world. Instead of like moving something up one point or one unit, you just kind of gently push the thumbstick and they move. Yeah. And so there's less discreet actions in board games, which leads less to logical puzzles like board games have and more to things that require movement and get their entertainment value from from movement and experiencing narrative and fluidity and simulating things in real life because they can yeah, do models and, think, and all that. I think maybe experience is the kind of the, the key concept there. Like they can curate an experience and you, rather than fighting a cube that has stats that you can look up on a card, you fight some creature that has visual cues as to what it, how powerful it is. And part of it is that video games more often are dexterity challenges compared to board games, which there are relatively few dexterity challenges in board games, whereas board games have relatively more intellectual challenges or purely intellectual challenges. Again, the exception there is those super hardcore video game players where you get things like pixel perfect runs where they actually do whittle down the board game to their discrete units, that of pixels. <laughs> And some, some do of crazy, crazy platforms things. Where you yeah. Have to be pixel perfect. Yeah. yeah. Before we close, in 30 seconds or less, Wes, could you talk about what the medium of VR will do well and not do well? That's totally up in the air right now, I think. I think it's still too much of a baby to really tell. I have earmarked some money to potentially purchase a Virtuix Omni, which is an omnidirectional treadmill. And I think that that will change everything if that actually works. If that technology evolves well, I think it's it's going to make a huge difference in the world because it'll essentially mean that I can go out and well, I can go I can go in and play Fallout 4 in VR and at the same time walk dozens upon dozens of miles over the course of a month and exercise my body. Yeah, like, that's cool. But what about when you yeah. need to like you're fighting and you need to roll and dodge the monster swipe? How will that work? I mean that that's an inherent limitation that's only going to be conquered by holodex. I mean that's not necessarily true. There, there's this really great channel on YouTube called Linus Tech Tips that they sometimes do crazy things or they feature crazy technology that's sort of just beyond the cusp of prosumer. And one of the things they featured was a computer that. It was actively cooled, so it had moving parts, so it had had like a fan, but it was a computer that was designed to be worn on your back and had a battery that lasted like two hours. It was a super powerful laptop, basically, that you could wear on your back and use a VR headset with, Hmm. so you had total freedom of movement, like 100% freedom of movement, while essentially wearing a backpack. Do you have to like mark out uh, and program in a specified real world space so that you don't like right. trip over a table yeah absolutely you do but then some people are saying that vr is going to die very quickly and that ar augmented reality is going to take its place which superimposes game elements over the real world intelligently using machine learning i'm just imagining pokemon go except instead of looking at your phone you have a whole vr headset and like a backpack where you have to store the pokeballs and you like reach back to grab another one and throw it at a rock and but it's actually a pokemon and you catch it or something 
Oh, for sure. It's coming. It's like our our children or you know, people in proximity to us as we age are going to encounter these strange technologies. I mean, most things, most physical sensations can be simulated to some degree using intelligent fashion, basically. Mm-hmm. Of like if you can imagine uh, like if, if you're gonna reach into that backpack and grab a Pokeball. If you have a series of cables that go to tensioners and servos that are attached to you, that it could simulate, like, it could tell where your fingers are, and when you touch the Pokeball, it could provide resistance on your fingers. You could have, like, special gloves that provide feedback as if you were touching something, even if your hand's not actually gripping, right? Right, exactly, because because it would use cables on the back of the glove that would tension yeah. as soon as you touch something, or as soon huh. as you grip something. So like that, there are people that say that that's the future. I VR is just not very good at locomotion right now. It's also very, very bad at directed storytelling. If you take like five minutes and watch playthroughs of LA Noir on on VR on on the Vive, it's horrifying. Like it, it's it's again like that nature of humanity on the internet thing of like what people do when they have total freedom and anonymity. <laughs> Because they're put in this beautiful directed story of this cop drama, and they just end up sticking their finger up everybody's nose and like <laughs> just doing weird things that don't fall in line with the story. Isn't that more just what people would do in the absence of all societal expectations? Yeah, Maybe. it it is. The ring but... of Gyges. What was that? It's the Ring of Gyges. I don't know what that is. Really? That's the yeah. story by Plato that inspired Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. My, but my point simply anyway. being that, like, video games still enforce a lot of that moral code on you. Like, you, there's no option in The Witcher to just, like, stick your pinky finger up somebody's nose. Right. Although I'm sure so, many people wish that there was. There's a degree, like, in a in a board game, you have maybe five actions you can take on your turn. And in The Witcher, you can run around and talk to, you know, hundreds of NPCs and attack them or fight monsters and all sorts of three-dimensional space and cast magic and stuff which is way more than you could do in a board game and then there's maybe vr where you kind of wander around and just touch everything i don't know <laughs> right you <laughs> wander it's, it's around and touch everything <laughs> is this a rock <laughs> yes it is <laughs> right my right. virtual it's... feedback gloves tell me that that feels like a rock <laughs> right it's it's the it's the i lick it yeah. Of, of video games, I guess. Well, the narrative I've heard with VR is that essentially people were crazy, like developers were crazy, super excited about VR. And then they like made these cool games and then they put people in them and then they realized they knew so little about motion sickness and like how the brain works with the inner ear. <laughs> and then they had to really scale back how they do movement in VR because people get sick so easily. Wow. That's not my understanding. Really? I, I know that there are a lot of people who get motion sick. I feel supremely bad for those people. That's a big reason why the Vive runs at like 120 hertz. Or I think it's at least 100 hertz. It never dips below 100 hertz. That it, it, You do have to kind of synchronize your technology with the, the fluid motion of the virtual reality headset. But I personally have never gotten even the slightest bit sick from hours in VR. And... Do you, the games Maybe you're in... playing, do they do fluid movement, like with a joystick? Or are they doing, like, click on a spot and teleport their movement? I've tried all sorts of different modes of locomotion. I find the, the like, analog stick movement where your body is not moving, but you are moving in the game, that is the most disconcerting. And, like, I have a hard time rectifying in my inner... It doesn't make me sick, you're but right. I, I do feel weird. But there is actually there's like there's a whole game dedicated to like testing different types of locomotion in VR, oh, cool. and it's, it's it's very interesting. Maybe I'll stream it sometime. They, like there's one game that that I play that's called Gorn. That it's a, a a gladiatorial combat simulator. Like it's it's a cartoonish gladiatorial combat simulator. But their movement system is really weird because you essentially reach out your hand, grab a point in space. And then that point in space becomes a pivot for your whole body. And it actually works super well. It's almost like rowing. It reminds, the motion that I end up making reminds me of rowing. Huh, that's weird. I'm like, I reach out, I grab a point, I pull myself with my arm to that point. Could you stream that, but not stream the game? Just stream you? (laughs) 
<laughs> I've, I've thought about that. I thought I've wondered what kind of show that would be if just I didn't show any series? game footage and it was just me in a vibe, like, flailing around. And then, yeah. but then none of the none of the game audio, just like a mic hooked to you, so you could hear you yeah. like breathing. <laughs> It'd be very avant garde. <laughs> No, 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 no. What what it needs to be, it needs to be a GoPro mounted to the headset, but then focused back on my mouth. <laughs> that was that's 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 the avant-garde film. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Well, I think I have learned more about how to analyze media during this podcast than I did prepping for it. I think your challenges to the ideas were good and, and made me focus my thoughts better. Do you feel like you have a better understanding of what we're, where we're coming from with the topic? I think so, yeah. Yeah. At the very least, I think it's an interesting intellectual exercise, and I, I'm curious to see, now that we're at the point where board games do other than like app integration, because obviously with app integration you could do a lot, and I am excited to see what happens there, but I'm curious of where we'll see new things that we wouldn't have expected within the confines of just like cardboard and plastic and pieces in a box. Because it does create a lot of limitations, but I think a lot of those limitations also are what make board games interesting to me. And I think people will figure out how to apply narrative and design ideas within the limitations of the physical medium to create a different experience. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's gonna it's gonna take a lot more kind of cleverness and innovation, probably. Yeah, and there's, I mean, yeah, there is a pattern of innovation, and you know, we see games and we get excited about how they break our expectations, and maybe maybe they pan out, maybe they maybe they don't, but um, it's ex- exciting to see that, you know, yeah. even in the games we've played in the last six months that have totally gone past what we thought was possible in a board game. Yeah. Anyway, that's our podcast for today. Let me know what you think about this discussion in the comments. I think this was, I don't know, it was interesting to me at least. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Hit me up on Twitter or Facebook if you want to chat. And check out the thoughtfulgamer.com for all of our content, uh, written and audio and some video coming up. If you would like to watch the podcast live and chat with us, in the YouTube chat. You can do that by joining our Patreon for just a couple bucks a month. You can join us live and be part of our Discord server and all that. And then if you don't like the commitment of Patreon, I just started a new way to help out the Thoughtful Gamer at a website called Coffee. That's ko-fi.com slash the Thoughtful Gamer, where you can buy me a coffee in quotation marks, which is just like three dollars. We'll be back next week with an off-week podcast and then in two weeks with another full podcast. Until then, we'll talk to you all soon. Goodbye. Peace out. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.